Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our Company of Heroes 3 Map Making 101 Lessons. Uh, this is Episode 3. My name is John. I'm one of the community managers on the team, and I'm here once again with Will. Hello, folks. Welcome back. Uh, so, Will, you have been walking us through how to use the World Builder in Company of Heroes 3. Um, can you pick up where we left off last time? I know we were looking at a lot of assets and actually finally placing buildings and structures um, and walls and things like that on the map. So so what have you done in the meantime? Right, yep. So I have carried on as much as I can in the meantime, just getting a basic layout together. What I've got on this map so far might not stick, some things will change, but what I did for the most part was continue building some of these urban areas, mostly on this side of the river. I added all three of our bridges in. I have two normal bridges and an infantry bridge. Mm -hmm. I finished laying the retaining walls. Um, we'll sort out water in a later episode. Uh, and I've also started adding some cliffs and things into uh, into the height where the terrain shifts from low to high, just so we have some more definite uh, edges to this this high ground. If I zoom in a little bit you'll see that it's still the same height difference that we set. It's five meters, mm -hmm. um, but now has just more definition to it. Um, I have also smoothed out a little bit more, added some blockers, which are these big rocks in the way, um, adjusted the roads ever so slightly where I needed to. Uh, and other than that, I've gone in and done a little bit more work on some of the farm fences but honestly this this area i will do behind the scenes a little bit later uh, in preparation for our next episode okay i i see um up top in the city there it's a it's a very uh i'll call it a spicy choice of having a bunch of bridges <laughs> on this map um can, can you maybe talk about some of the gameplay or design intent behind this type of design or having these types of bridges on this map yeah sure so Fundamentally, bridges are a more of a casual design element. We know that Company of Heroes is a complex RTS. There's a lot of elements to our game, and it's very fast-paced, especially for players who aren't used to RTS games. Mm -hmm. So what bridges do is bottleneck enemy troops and essentially limit the amount of ground that you need to pay attention to. If your enemy is rushing across a bridge, then you're only covering one front and not having to worry about, say, covering a 180 degrees arc in front of you in an open field. Right. So what an area like this does is it makes the gameplay easier to handle, easy to manage for players who just aren't as experienced. But what I've done in this map, because it's, it's a map where I wanted to show off as many different gameplay elements as we can, we have the more casual gameplay in the north contrasted with the more complex and difficult gameplay in the south where there's just a lot more open ground, a lot more opportunity for flanking and probably more aggressive vehicle gameplay. Whereas up here would be more infantry centric and close quarters. Mm -hmm. I like it. You're, you're, it's a very diplomatic map, finding the best of both worlds. Yeah. Now that's not to say that you can't, still use bridges in more competitive maps, but what you have to make sure is that those bridges are not the only ways to get from A to B. Mm -hmm. For example, I could get rid of this bridge, create a land bridge here. So let's say, for example, I take one of these retaining walls, I could slap that in about there and fill all this terrain in and make this whole area pathable, um, which would open up this part of the map a lot more. Mm -hmm. The thing with bridges is, because they're destructible, eventually these three routes will be closed off and it'll be a lot harder for players to get from one side of the city to the other. Right. Um, which again is is on purpose. It's for more casual play so that you can spend more time gathering resources, reinforcing, learning the game rather than being aggressive and on the back foot all the time. Okay. Uh, I, I noticed the, the open area was a little bit sparse. I know you said you're going to kind of fill in some of that a little bit later. Is, mm -hmm. is there anything... Um, is there any sort of specific reason why you didn't place more stuff there right now? Yes. Yeah, so this, this little area here, I dressed up because I um, have an example I'm going to show you in a little bit. But otherwise, these, these areas, these courtyards, I'm leaving empty because we don't know how these engagement spaces play yet. Mm -hmm. And there's a term that I will use a few times in this episode. An engagement space is a term that, I, I mean, I must have heard it from somewhere, but otherwise I've made it up. 
An engagement space is an area about a screen in size. So if I reset my camera, this would be considered an engagement space. And this is where you expect combat to occur. So we design these spaces to make the most fun possible. Okay. For example, this engagement space has got four main routes of entry. You've got through here, through here, through this gap, and then through this top here. And then you've got every single doorway would also count as a minor entrance into the space. So if you've got something important, like a capture point in the middle here, there are lots of ways in, lots of ways out, and lots of fighting to be had. In the same vein, we have another engagement space over here with only three ways in, three right. routes and fewer buildings, but the cover inside here is what the players will be using to enter the area and then fight their way through and out of it. If we go to the fields down here, let's say this one, for example, this engagement space is a lot more sparse, a lot more open. The cover won't last as long because it's mostly light crush, but it's the same principle. You've got four or five routes in and you've got something important in the middle. This tree will probably get moved out of the way for a capture point of some kind. Right. We'll put hay bales, tractors, that sort of thing in this area. So you've got cover to jump to as you leave the walls and move into the engagement space. Okay. So we'll get onto that as we go along. Uh, but I've mentioned capture points. That is probably something we should jump onto. Um, I, I feel like that's an important part of a, a Company of Heroes it game. It certainly is. Now, I, I am sure as well I mentioned that a more competitive map usually starts with the territory layout. If you're going for your first map, don't worry about doing territory and net until you're about here. But if you specifically want to make a competitive map, something for tournaments, I would start with drawing out a territory layout on, it could be anything like paint or Photoshop if you have it. You could draw it out technically on here, on the map with splines, that is absolutely fine. But a good territory layout makes a competitive map. And it is difficult to add a territory layout to a, a map you finish after the fact. Uh, because the engagement spaces won't necessarily fit with where the territory goes. Mm -hmm. uh, and the flow of the territory also just simply may not work. Flow is another thing we'll move on to at some point. But for now, let's get some territory points in the map. To place your first territory point, if you uh, right-click on your territory layer, hit Add... We're going to add an entity, go into Blueprint, and this time, instead of going into Environment, we're going into Gameplay. In Gameplay, we have got uh, Strategic Points, and here we have the, the variety of Strategic Points you can choose from. Now, Company of Heroes has three resources. Uh, it has um, Strategic Points, which will generate manpower, granted only small amounts of it. We also have munitions points, which will give you munitions to purchase off-map call-ins, artillery, use abilities, buy upgrades. And we also have fuel, which will be used for your tech buildings and vehicles. We also down here have victory points, which is what we'll use in a moment. But you'll also notice this folder called SP. This is for single player. You won't need this. Um, so let's go into victory. And you'll notice there's quite a few things in here. You only need one of two of them. We have these two at the top and the bottom. So the victory point itself is the main flag. This is what you'll see in most of our maps. Okay. The territory victory point rectangle has a rectangular capture area. This is mostly for uh, having capture points on roads. So okay. if you want the capture area itself to be the road, but you don't want the flagpole to be in the middle of a road to block movement, you, you can use one of those. For now, though, I'm going to use this, just a normal victory point. Mm -hmm. And here it is. So what we're going to do is choose three locations to have these victory points. If you're going to go for a more competitive map, three is the way to go. Uh, there are some maps where you might have more than this. Catania Crossing, for example, has four victory points. It has two either side of the river. And what that does is it slows down the gameplay, gives you more time. Generally, those games take a lot longer. And in some cases, you could even go to five victory points. But what that causes is games to go faster because it's easier to have a majority of points over your opponent. And once you have, say, four and they only have one, the tick down of their points will be a lot, a lot faster. Okay. Uh, 
quick question about before we get too far down this road. I, I know we have two sort of main game modes in Company of Heroes. We've got Annihilation and Victory Points. So does that play into any of my considerations as I'm designing my map? Like, let's say if I'm specifically designing, like, or, or I guess my, my question should be, should I specifically design for one or the other, or, or should I be taking both into account when I'm making my map? I would recommend both. Um, now, the way that we've done our territory system is like Co One did did theirs. So victory points in Co Three don't create their own territory sector, which means if you play Annihilation, the victory points are just simply removed, and it won't leave any weird territory behind where they used to be. Okay. So uh, I would still always put victory points in, even if you only intend to play Annihilation, just so that if somebody else wants to play a victory point on your map, they still can. Uh, and for all intents and purposes, it's a very simple thing to do to put three flags down. So we need to choose three locations uh, to put our VPs. Now, the first one I'm going to go and put in the south here. I want this section to be something that's worth fighting over, so a victory point makes perfect sense. I'm going to copy it. I'm going to put a second one smack bang here. So right in the middle of the river. So it's going to be in the middle of this section. The last one is going to be tricky because I don't have a central point in my city. So I need to decide what to do here. I can either put two, one on either side, and we end up with four victory points. Mm -hmm. Or I can remove one of them from this part of the map and have two in the urban area and one down here. That would give you more reason to go to the, the urban area to fight over it for victory points, but that would mean we'd probably ought to offset that by putting more important resources like fuel and munitions down here. Right. So, let's... Hmm, it's tricky. Tricky, tricky, tricky. Live decision making, no it pressure. Is. You know what I'm going to do? I am actually going to do what I mentioned earlier. I'm going to turn this into a land bridge, and I'm going to put my last one on land up here. Okay. Because, because live decision making. So I want to get rid of this bridge. Let's do it. I'm going to turn this into a land bridge. Let's slap it down here. So this is something that I'll obviously refine. I need to play test it and see how it works. Let's get rid of these rocks. We don't need them for now. Get rid of this retaining wall. This is probably a good example of um, something you should always keep in mind when map making. Don't be afraid to destroy your best work. <laughs> it is absolutely okay to rip stuff up and rebuild. If it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. Uh, at the end of the day, I want this map to be uh, a kind of a mix between competitive and casual. So I'm going to have to have a nice, fair victory point layout. Mm -hmm. Kill um, your darlings, as they say. Yes. So. Oh, but your poor river. Uh, so what I will do is put uh, some drains and vents in here. So it looks like the water is running underneath in a ground table and coming out here. Phew. Good. My immersion. Um, we'll get onto water at some point in the art pass. So now we have a victory point, which I can slap here. In fact, this is a perfect opportunity to use the rectangular version. Um, and then this area here will be contested over for this central point. Lovely. Okay, right. So we have our three victory points. What I might do, because that one is so far north, I might move this one a little bit further up here now. So it's kind of equal distance between them, mm -hmm. or at least by eye. Yep. Is, is there a more uh, technical way that, that you should be sort of gauging that distance between victory points, or is it a lot of sort of feel and eyeballing? For me, it's more the feel, because I've been doing this for uh, a long, long time. But if you do want to be more accurate up here, so underneath your scenario, you will have a ruler. This ruler will um, pop up in the bottom. In fact, I might just move mine over to the side here, because it's easy to read. Um, so I'm going to say, yep, generic pathfinding for infantry. Uh, and I'm going to say left click and then right click. And it creates a path for you. And it will follow infantry pathing from A to B. And it will tell you how far away it is. So for this team 
to get to this victory point is 173 meters with pathfinding. Oh, that's super handy. Okay. And if I do the same here, it doesn't get there because it can't find an easy path around. So I may have to adjust the node ever so slightly. Mm, nah. Either way, the straight distance is 165, so we can use that mm -hmm. against 160, which is absolutely fine. Okay. In the metrics of our game, about 5 meters, in fact, even 10 meters, doesn't really make much difference. Uh, units can travel relatively fast, so they'll cover that distance in no time. But if you want to adjust that, let's say this is on the perfect center line, it probably just means that one of these HQs is a little too far north and can be adjusted down wherever you want. But you can also use that tool to measure between points. So between these victory points is 182 meters as the crow flies and 140 as the crow flies. That is actually okay with me. I'm not, I'm not upset about these two being slightly closer to each other mm -hmm. because it's more open ground. Right. Um, I will have resources up in here that make the urban area more worthwhile, um, whereas the middle and the south will be more victory point worthwhile. But either way, we can change these as we go along. Right, so the important thing to note about victory points, as I mentioned earlier, they do not have their own territory sectors. They go within other territory created by other territory points. So what we'll need to do is create some territory points. So let's go into territory again. Right click, add, entity, pick the blueprint, we want gameplay, we want strategic points. And then what I'm gonna do is grab one of each. So I'm gonna grab a fuel point. Let's start with low. Of note in here, we have some more rectangular ones of each, but we now have highs, mediums, and lows. We'll get onto those in a moment. But here's a low fuel point. I'm gonna clone it. I'm gonna make this one a low munitions point. I'm going to clone it again and get a strategic point. There are no highs, mediums, and lows with strategic points. It's just that one or the rectangular one. The other ones are just um, single player that you mm -hmm. don't need to worry about. Okay. So, John, do you know the difference between low, medium, and high resource points? Uh, I can't believe my professor is quizzing me in the <laughs> middle of this video. Um uh, I'm going to sound like a total fool. I think low is five. It is. And high is 15. 10. 16. Okay. So we, we do it slightly off kilter, again, just like Co1. So a low point is worth plus five, a medium is plus 10, and a high is plus 16. Right. So when you're placing these points, you want to be keeping an eye on how much resource value they have. So if I have nothing but a map full of low resource points, basically capture points won't be worth very much. You want to put in a, a mix of mediums and some highs in there wherever you can. Mm -hmm. For reference, if you want a nice balanced map, our economy in Comedy of Heroes 3 is set so that the entire map has 80 munitions and 40 fuel. So if you hold half the map, you should ideally be getting about 40 munitions, half of 80, or 20 fuel, half of 40. Um, so what we need to do in our design is make sure that we have around those amounts. Okay. Five higher will make games go faster. Five lower will make games go slower. Okay. You do and, whatever you pick. And do, the, do those numbers sort of equate across uh, team size? Yes, yes. So the only difference with bigger team games is... I would make sure that your maps have more capture points. Mm -hmm. In one versus one, you probably only want about 13 capture points. That seems to be the average we go for. Uh, that's enough for players to go and do things in different areas of the map, and it gives them enough to do. But in four versus four, you've got four players per team. And if you only have 13 capture points on the entire map, then every player only has to capture one or two points each right. and they've already captured the entire map so for the bigger maps go for more points and go for the lower values and in 1v1 2v2 fewer points at higher value right so let's get a very very basic layout going what i'm going to do is actually rotate my camera to be bird eye view 
I find it's easier this way when I'm doing territory. And I'm going to lay out some very, very basics. So I'm going to... In fact, I have something I would recommend to everyone, just because it's easy to visualize. Let's do this first. Let's go to splats and add one. Uh, splat is down here next to spline. We're going to be looking in splats debug. And we have point value low, point value medium, and point value high. So what I'm going to do is grab one of these. And if I zoom back in, you may notice that this thing I've created is absolutely tiny. It's because it hasn't been rescaled yet. So what we're going to do is uh, find, where are we? Oh yeah, scale. If we right click on scale and hit reset, there we go. <laughs> it makes it much bigger. If you hit the uh, R key, you can scale down. I'm gonna make mine maybe this big. So these red ones, I'm gonna count as my fuel points because so, fuel so can, you, can you describe, Will, what a splat is? Because to me, it sounds like a Nickelodeon show from the 90s. Yes, <laughs> what a reference. Um, a splat is a movable texture. So it's not something you paint with a brush. It is just a texture that will be laid on top of your ground textures, but they don't impact gameplay in any way unless they're craters. Craters are also splats, and they provide light cover. Okay, so outside of craters, they're basically just a marker for, for us as they're we go. Just a marker, and okay. these will get deleted once we're done. Okay. So I want to get the low value. Let's get the medium value, which will be yellow, and let's get the high value, which is green. In our game, uh, red usually means, uh, I need to hit this black button, red means fuel, green means munitions, yellow means strategic, and what I'm going to do is grab the yellow one and hit color up here and make a black one for victory points. So now if I zoom all the way out, instead of looking for tiny, tiny flags, I have these big spots I can use instead. So I'm going to start putting these points around my map where I think territory points should go. Mm -hmm. So I think let's have two fuel points in the opposite bottom corners, and then let's have two munitions points either side of the VP in the bottom. Let's put a black spot under the victory points. One, two, and three. Let's think about strategic points. These are a bit unique. A strategic point in Company of Heroes is very fast to capture and is actually worth very little manpower. What they tend to do better is connect other territory points together. So if you wanted to have a map with cutoffs, for example, strategic points are the way to have them because it takes about seven seconds, I believe, to decapture a strategic point. And if you have that connected to roads or whatever, it means you can deny your enemy resources by capturing them. Right, and cutoffs essentially being uh, unique, uniquely positioned in such a way that if you take them, your opponent is no longer getting the benefit of the territories that it would be connected to on the other side. Right? Precisely, yeah. And we will show you how to do that um, in a moment with painting them. So I'm going to put some strategic points on the corners of these two main roads here. Like that. Uh, okay, let's put some more fuel points. Maybe just here on the entrances to the town on either side. And then let's maybe put some more in these little nooks here. So at the moment, I'm just eyeballing. I'm looking for areas that look interesting. Uh, let's go for a munitions point maybe in here and one in here. And then... I'm confused. Are those munitions or fuel? Munitions are green. Oh. Fuel are red. Gotcha. Um, you can go for whatever system you like, to be honest, but, um, yeah, and I'll put one on the road here. So again, this is just eyeballing. This will not stay. Things will change. Um, what else have we got? Let's just slap a little one down here outside the HQs as well. And then we just need to do something with this area here. Let's maybe go for munitions points in those ones, fuel points in those ones. Oops, sorry. Get rid of those. Your points in these ones. There we go. So we now have a collection of spots. In total, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So 22 
capture points, which mm -hmm. is probably pretty healthy for a 2v2 map. Okay. We as, sorry? As you're kind of going through this process, I know it was very quick. So how do you decide the distribution between placing, you know, a munitions point, a fuel point, or, or um, a manpower point? So that is entirely up to you, uh, how you do them. You can have areas of a map which is mostly fuel if you wanted to. I tend to go for more of a staggered layout. So if you look at the distance between my fuel and my munitions anyway, it goes fuel, munitions, fuel, munitions, fuel, munitions. And then there's a couple of exceptions. Mm -hmm. um, what I tend to do is have at least a couple of fuel points and munitions points close to the central line. These ones will be more important. But the back areas of your maps at the back corners, I've put fuel points because I want a reason for players to go and get them. Uh, if you give the players a sufficient reason to go and find resources to take them away from the battle, um, then all parts of your map will get seen. But if in playtesting, if in practice, let's say this fuel point and this fuel point just don't get much play, they're not worth going out of your way to get, then we can look at maybe cutting off this corner of the map mm -hmm. um, and just directing you more towards this strategic point and this munitions point down here. And I guess you could also change the value of those points as well. Of course, yeah. So um, depending on what kind of map you want, having higher value points further away from um, the central line, because the central line is something that's contestable, both players can get their hands on it. By having higher resources out the, of out the way in the back corners means you're going to have a more casual map. It's easier to stockpile resources if you've got high resources towards the back end. Whereas the more competitive, you would have low resources in these corners. Mm -hmm. And you'll see most competitive players will just beeline straight for the front line and get the high resources first. Um, but again, we haven't painted them yet. These things could change. We've still got to do a little bit of um, cowboy maths as we go along because we need to see whether or not there's enough points even on here for um, the balance of our game for the economy. So let's untick all these. I don't want to select anything other than the capture points. Let's grab the strategic point we have. Here he is. Let's put one down on that spot and copy it. Another one on that spot and copy it. And same again on these. And same again on these. One thing that's important is not to copy these uh, points from your HQs. How I mentioned before that usually once you've got an asset in your map, it's easier to just copy it and then mm -hmm. change its blueprint. Don't do that with your HQ sectors if you can, because these are owned. And what right. you don't okay. want is for your territory points to start already owned by a player, unless that's something you specifically want. So always make sure your territory points are owned by the world. Uh, right. Let's do the same thing now with our um, munitions points. For now, I'm going to keep all these points at low, and we can move them to mediums or highs based on how many uh, resources we have on our map. So I'm going to plonk him down on the greens. Go. That's our next one. I'm going to have to move this fuel point out of the way because it's currently sharing. And this one over here as well. This one, I'm going to have to move the fountain out of the way. Plonk. And then we have one more over here. I think this was going to be a rectangle one because it's on the road. Actually, that was a medium. Let's go for a low. And then the last one's over here. I believe that's all of them. Here it is. Okay. And then let's do the same again with the fuels. So I have my fuel point here. Plonk them down on the red spots. Well, I can't believe you've done this to me because muni you know munitions are red in the game, and I just I just can't get over it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to say it because I know the comments are going to be calling it out. Yeah, no, this this is the way my brain has been working for 10 years. I can't stop it now. <laughs> we can't change it now. I can't change it. Okay, so that's it. We have all the points. We have everything. Oh, no, we don't. We missed one. And let's grab you. There we go. Right. 
That is all of our territory points laid out. Mm -hmm. So now we just need to do a quick head count. Let's assume that all these points stay low, which means they're only worth five. So on our map, we've got five, 10, 15, 20, 40 fuel. Perfect. So we have enough fuel points to hit our 40 economy limit, which is right. great. If I wanted to turn one of these fuel points into a plus 10, I would probably have to take two of them off the map and replace them with one somewhere else. Okay. For example, I could put a fuel point in the river here and have a bigger section be owned by a single fuel point. In fact, for variety, let's do it. Okay. Let's do exactly that. So I'm going to move this over here and get rid of this one. And this is now going to be worth 10 fuel. Okay, and I imagine that encourages people to fight over it as well. Absolutely. That's the main reason for doing it, because I want fighting to be on the central line, not next to it in some areas. Same way this victory point. This is going to cause uh, fighting right down the center, not mm -hmm. next to the center. Right. Would it, would it be worthwhile doing that with another one of those points? I'm looking at the munitions point and the um, manpower point sort of just north of that central Yeah, very point. much so. So we'll see which is which is probably the better fit. So let's do a quick count of munitions. There's more munitions points on this map, but we need more munitions in general. So we've got 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. So only 50 on the whole map, and we need 80. Okay. So what we can do is either add more munitions points or we can make them bigger. Um, so what I might do is make these two down here, because they're closer to the center, I'm going to grab them both at the same time by holding shift and turn them both into mediums. So now we have 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 okay. per side. So we only need 10 more. Okay. Um, so because these two are also closer to the center line, Let's also make the mediums. Now we have 5, 10, 20, 25, 35. We just need five more per side. So what I might do is follow your advice and put one in the center. Mm -hmm. But I like this area. This, this calls to me. So what I'm going to do is add a new point. Grab this, plonk it here make this a medium, and now we should have enough. We have plus five either side, but it's now split down the middle. Okay, is, is there a, an easy way to see uh, the total like munitions, fuel, manpower that a map is generating, or do you have to sort of manually count everything? You've got to manually count it. You can go and play test it, mm -hmm. and uh, just capture all the territory, or just capture half and see how it's looking. Uh, but yeah, there's no easy way to do this, unfortunately. Okay. Um, right. We are now actually at a critical moment where we can't save without errors. So what we should do before anything else is calculate Voronoi, which I mentioned in the very first episode. So if you go to select territory map, this initialized Voronoi up here will add territory under every new flag we've added, and it will also auto-generate them. So with Voronoi, it will expand outwards from each flag until it meets the border of another flag, which you'll see now. Aha, okay. How bright and colorful. So this is every territory expanding its borders until it hits the borders of another territory. This is just bare bones. You can create a map like this and play it, and that's absolutely fine. Uh, we are going to hand paint ours, but for the purposes of being able to save, we can now save. Okay. It will take a little while, but it's all done. There we go. And that is now safe to go and play test. So if you want to go and calculate how much you have in terms of resources, now you can go and do that. Just go up to build, build mod, and it should appear in your skirmish map list. That was really fun, Will. I actually feel like a designer now. <laughs> right. So we've still got quite a few more things to, to cover. So um, first and foremost, I'm going to show you how to paint territory. And then I'm going to leave territory behind. I'm going to let you go and explore by yourselves and see how you get on with it. But while you are on the territory editor, you'll notice that it has a painter, just like the other tools that we've looked at, like the height map editor. 
If you can remember as well, we ticked all these to be on. So overlay flash nil and unconnected flash, they are both on. So if any of your territory points for some reason end up disconnected, they will flash and they will tell you. Um, if for whatever reason you add a new territory point because you decide something doesn't work, you can just click on this add new territories. And similarly, if you get rid of a territory point, uh, you can just remove deleted territories and it will just get rid of it. Um, but just be aware that once you start hand painting territory, do not hit this initialize Voronoi button again, unless you want to lose all of your progress hand painting, because okay. it will just auto reset. So anyways, the best way to use the territory editor that I can recommend is use the sample button, the dropper bottle. Just click it, click on any territory you want, and it will tell you you've got the right territory selected if this cursor is coming from the correct flag. So while it is like this, any area that I paint will be of that color. Ah, okay. So you can go in and you can hand paint, and what this will do is create a unique territory layout that you can see in-game based on how you've painted it. So for example, what I would want to do is, on the roads, for example, I'll do this very, very rough in the interest of time, I want these roads to belong to this strategic point. So I'm going to paint all the way along this road here. This belongs to this. And then this territory point up here, I'm going to do the same thing. Paint along the roads because I want it to belong to this territory point. Same over here. I want all this land down here to belong to me. Up to there. And then it's going to go down this road. And then this one is going to meet it up here. Like so. Okay, so I, I kind of looking at this, you really have to be cognizant, especially if you have two similar points touching each other, which territory belongs to which. Yes, now, yeah, you'll notice that all four of these have now become the same color. Right. This is this is just an editor limitation. This is not something that's um, always the case. As soon as you save, they will suddenly gain their own color again. Okay, gotcha. Uh, so what I've done here is I have encapsulated all the central points here. Oops, misclick. Uh, with the strategic points, I could go further, and with this munitions point, I might color in all the way up to the center of the river. Here, for example, same with this area, paint all the way down to here, and then have all this bottom area belong to the fuel point. And I notice there are some very angry points that are flashing at you right now. Yes, so this is because we have that setting on. So if there's any territory that is disconnected from its point, it'll flash to tell you. Okay. Which is perfectly fine. Um, the uh, territory points, if you can remember this null point from episode one, this also can be painted in the exact same way. So if we wanted to paint our territory, sorry, our uh, HQ area where you can build all of your buildings, we can do that here too. Just do it something simple like that. There we go. And you can build your HQ buildings anywhere in this area. And eventually these territory points will start to take shape. But... Don't worry about doing too much of this until you're really, really happy with your map's layout. If your map layout changes, chances are your territory layout also has to change. Mm -hmm. And there's, as with everything, no reason why you can't change your territory layout. What you have the first time around is going to be flawed. Play it in game, see how it looks. You may find, for example, that if a capture point is too close to another capture point, it's hard to read them on the minimap, so you might want to separate them a little bit. You may find that you just have too many capture points and you want to reduce the number, or the opposite, you may want to increase it. Territory points are great for encouraging players to enter an area because they, they need to. So if you have an area of your map that you want to make interesting, put territory in it because players will automatically go there. And equally, if you have areas of your map that you don't find as interesting, like the back corners and you don't want players to go there, don't put territory there. Mm -hmm. and they will have a reason to ignore it. Um, yeah, right. Let's leave territory behind for now, but any further questions on it, John? 
Uh, no, I don't think so. I think I think that's that's covered it. Okay, lovely. So you'll notice that I I have the color overlay. Uh, you can get rid of any overlays that you don't want by going on scenario overlays and none. But while you're on the territory tool, this will always be here. You can also just get rid of it by clicking on an asset, and it will go back to the basic overlay for placing assets. Okay. Uh, right. Let's have a little look at cliffs and impasse. So, when you have an asset selected, you will notice that it has this red grid underneath it. It can be hard to read when you've not got text clues on the ground. But this red, red grid here is actually the impasse footprint. Impasse refers to where units cannot travel. So even though there's a gap here between these two rocks, the impasse from these rocks is so big, you can't actually enter this area. Now, this is a, a common problem with big assets like rocks. So I'm going to teach you a little trick that we've used in the vast majority of our maps, and that is actually to turn these into visual assets. Okay. A visual asset will not block shots, it won't block sight, and it won't block movement. It is there just purely to be visual. It is there to look pretty. But by turning it visual, it means that that gap is now passable, or at least it will be once I turn this rock visual as well. So now units can not only travel through this gap, they can also just walk straight through the rocks themselves. Okay. So um, we'll, go on. I have so many questions. <laughs> I, I feel like that that obviously helps uh, alleviate some some pain points or, or some some problem areas that we might encounter on, on the map. Um, however, I feel like that could potentially break you know a lot of the immersion for for the player yeah and we we have to be careful with with how we use visual assets you do need to do a little bit of work around them mm -hmm. uh but i'm going to show you all the things you'll need to basically make this into a functioning cliff okay without the big footprint that gets in the way all right uh so what we need next is the impasse tools so up here we have these two arrows pointing in different directions it's called the select impasse map it brings up this red grid. If this red grid is on screen, it basically means that any units can travel through this area. Um, what we're going to be doing is hand painting in impasse where we don't want units to go. So if any of these boxes is ticked, it means this unit type can't travel here. Okay. So infantry actually count as team weapons. It's one of those weird nuances of our game. We have vaulting infantry for the infantry that can vault over walls. Normal infantry would count as mortars, uh, AT guns, HMGs, the units that can't vault. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I just paint now, that area that's now in green, HMGs, mortars, and AT guns cannot travel through there. Wow, that seems very harsh. I can't believe you do that. Though. I know, right? I really hate them. Um... Similarly, if I were to, let's say I wanted to make this little area infantry only, which would probably be quite smart, what I would do is select all of our vehicle types. Navy doesn't do anything, but I tend to select it anyway. That's a, a holdover from Age of Empires. We also have all these trench crossing vehicle types. Make sure you select those because most of our tanks can cross trenches. And what I'm going to do is paint in this gap. So now... The only units that can travel through there are the ones that are not selected. Infantry and vaulting infantry. Okay. But what I want to do is make sure these rocks are also completely impassable to everyone. So I'm going to select every single unit type, take a bird eye view, and paint the entire rock nice and carefully. Same over here, paint it nice and careful. And... This is essentially turning it back into an asset. Same with all the other painters. Right-click is to erase. Mm -hmm. So if you make a mistake, it doesn't matter. And I will go around and I will do every single cliff with this impasse. And this will just stop units from ever traveling through them. I see. Okay. Doesn't look so bad. Mm -hmm. And and how can I go back and sort of check my impasse work? Because I know we made that exception for infantry in mm. this gap here. So is there a way for me to easily check that? Yeah, so if you untick the right amounts, oh, sorry, I should, uh, yeah, that's right. So um, once you've gotten these set to where it was before, so at the moment we should be looking at all the impasse I've painted, but the past types I have here are 
all the vehicles, you then need to go on to a different overlay. Scenario, overlay, path map. Now, when you select it, nothing will happen, and this is where a very important button comes in, up here. This deselect all will change your overlay for you. Okay. Now, it looks as though this hasn't been updated. This is still showing some real big hitboxes. So what I need to do is hit this button, regenerate all. Fingers crossed. There we go. It's regenerated. It's still saying my units can't travel through here. So something must have gone awry. So let's try again. Let's open up the impasse map. What I might do is uh, I might freshly delete this like that. Uh, with everything selected, I will just fill that gap in. Okay. Make this nice and narrow now, only three cells wide, and I want only vehicles to be blocked. So let's paint these in like so. Okay. That should now work. Let's go back to the path map, regenerate all. Still doesn't seem to like me doing that for some reason, so something else must be amiss. I wonder if there's some rocks that I haven't made visual properly. Hmm. Nope, it's all right. I wonder. Either way, we'll come back to that. We'll see if we can uh, work out what's actually happening there. Okay. Um, but yeah, the intention being that... Oh, I think I know what it is. I think I know what it is. So for the impasse, what I want to actually do is only have the units I want to travel through here selected. So if I have infantry and vaulting infantry, it tells me I can get through that gap. And if I put the path map on, it also says I can path through there. Okay. Red doesn't mean you can't go there. Red just means units will struggle to travel through this area. Vehicles, for example, will get caught up. Um, but it's if it's transparent, so it's the areas uh, beyond the red, that means you just simply cannot go there. All right. So that is a nice, very narrow two-cell wide. We should probably make it wider path for infantry only, that vehicles cannot follow them down. Okay. Anyways, let's uh, go back onto our impasse. So what I would need to do is select all the impasse, and go around every single area I don't want the player to go and paint it all in uh, piece by piece, which will take time, so I will do that mostly off camera, but it will very much look like this. Just fill it all in. And what that also does, something that we'll cover in the, the final episode with the finishing touches, this will also appear on our mini-map. So areas that are completely impassable that we've painted on our mini-map will appear as dark grey. Uh, so they'll look like cliffs or impassable areas. Okay. Right. There's something else we should probably do while we have the impasse editor out, and that is funneling. So if you can remember, way, way, way back, we had these map entry points. These are what your units use to enter the map. What you may notice in playing is that when units spawn here, they don't necessarily go straight into the playable area. They may take a little cheeky route around the sides. So what I'd recommend is painting just a little impassable barrier somewhere or other, maybe around here. And this will just force these units to enter the map at some point. You can put rocks here or cliffs or whatever you want it to off map. But this is used just to funnel your units into the game. It used to be a very common occurrence in CO2 that if you didn't do this, units would start running around the outer border of the map when controlled by the AI and just appear wherever they wanted to. It was a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> is, is there any harm in making that uh, funnel narrower or is it is it sort of best practice to kind of keep it wide on the outside of the base sector? No, like it's that? absolutely fine to be wherever you want it. Just bear in mind that it will appear as a line on your minimap. So I would put it underneath a rock or something so that it makes sense to be there. Uh, I just tend to do mine around here. Units will mostly enter the map okay. the way they should. It's yep. just in case. Uh, right. So let's go back to our rocks. At the moment... Oh, sorry. I have the overlay on. If you go to scenario, overlays, and none, it'll go back to normal. These rocks um, that we turn into viz don't block shots, don't block movement, don't block sight. 
we've dealt with the movement problem by putting impasse down, but what we haven't done is retained their ability to block sight or shots. So what we need is a blocker. So what I'm going to do is go back up to my, my layers, and I have a layer called blockers. I'm going to add. Now I'm going to show you two different types. Let's go for the easy one to begin with. This one you don't have much control over. So it's an entity, you just grab a blueprint. It's under gameplay. Uh, it is under blockers. And I believe it is the uh, six by six by two movement blocker. There we go, looks like this. There are other variants of this. There's uh, 12 by 12, which is bigger. I believe we also have some smaller ones like the four by one by one, but either way, these blockers are what you can use to plonk down inside your assets and they will essentially block movement for you if that's what just what you wanted to do. Okay. But bear in mind, this is only a movement blocker. And like I said, it's, it's not amazing. It doesn't have a lot of, um, uh, a lot of utility. This bigger version up here, however, move site shot blocker is the same appearance, it just does more things. So you can pick and choose what you want it to do. Um, honestly though, this is a little bit too um, basic for my liking because it's a square, you can't really do complex shapes with it. Mm -hmm. Whereas these ones up here, the one by sixes, these are much better. This one by six move shot sight blocker looks like this. It's very narrow, you can do lots with it. And what we're going to do is add this to a spline. So I'm going to get rid of this because we won't need it. So let's add in blockers a spline. In that spline, let's add a wall. And in that wall, let's add an entity. And then let's grab that. Oh, I forgot you can't do that. You have to add it yourself. So I'm going to get rid of that. And in Entity, I'm going to look for Gameplay Blockers. The 1x6 Move Shot Sight Blocker. And there we are. We have a nice little wall of them. So, as before with our previous walls, what I want to do is make sure these don't bend to the terrain. It will look a little bit odd. So I'm going to set it to None. It'll go down to zero, way down below the ground. I can just hit R and drag it back up to the surface. There we go. And what you can do now is move this to conform to the shape of your rock. If I right click to add more, I can change the shape of it. You may also notice this is a, a, a common bug where assets will start going lower and lower towards zero when you add them to a spline. Easy fix though, all you do is select all the nodes and just set the height to 20 and they'll all reappear to the surface again. So just remember that if a spline that you're extending just looks like it's broken and everything's going underground, just reset the height of all the individual nodes in the spline. All right, job done. So what I'm going to do now is copy this. It's a little, oh, uh, I forgot. My bad, I still have all of the nodes selected. Deselect. <laughs> <laughs> Try again. There we go. So now I'm going to grab the same spline again, and I'm just going to grab the nodes and nudge it so that it basically fills the shape of the rock. Like so. And and just a re reminder for me, so the, the blocker itself isn't visible once it's in... Once you're in game, precisely, it's yeah. just preventing those things, like preventing sight, preventing people from passing through it. Yeah, yeah. So this this is designed to not appear in game. Uh, if it does appear in game for whatever reason, um, you may be using an old version of them. But this this one that I've highlighted, the one by six move shot sight blocker, is the one we use in all of our maps. So it should work perfectly fine. Um. And what, all you need to do is go onto any rock that you've turned into viz and lay these around in a shape around it. And it will now block sight and shot and movement because of the impasse you've painted too.
Okay. Are, are there any concerns there about like, um, I guess in this specific example, it's not really of a good concern, but I'm, get, I'm kind of thinking about like, you know, if there was infantry on the top of that hill, uh -huh. then they wouldn't be able to shoot anything underneath them. Is that, is that correct? So they can still technically shoot through this rock, but they won't be able to see beyond this blocker. Right, so anything that's tucked up right against that rock there. Is absolutely fine, yeah. Okay, but what you can do if you have those concerns, let's say, for example, because this rock is actually taller than the land around it, what I'm going to do is copy this blocker, make it into a, a straighter line. Yeah, that'll do nicely. Hit the R key, and I'm going to raise it up to the height of the rock. I see, okay. So now I'm essentially guaranteeing that any units up here will not be able to see through this rock at all. If you look at the height, the blocker is higher than the ground they're on. Units mm -hmm. just won't be able to see through it at all. Okay. So that could be desirable if you want this to be a proper site blocker, then great. Otherwise, what you may want to do is get rid of a blocker like that. Let me unlock Viz, because this is now a Viz asset. And I'm going to instead make this cliff lower because I want units to be able to shoot down. So I'm going to rotate them ever so slightly, just add a bit of a tilt, and then rotate down. So now I would expect players up here to be able to see down off this cliff. I see, okay. Okay, so it's a little time consuming, but it is one of the, the important gameplay implications. If you have loads of cliffs like this and you want narrow pathways, then turning them into vis objects, adding impasse and adding blockers to them is important. Time consuming, but important. Um, right. Let's just go back to something we had a little look at earlier from a gameplay perspective, which is the path map. So if I go back onto scenario, overlays, and path map, this appears. What we're looking at at the moment, this, this um, red border, is essentially where um, infantry can't go. So this is HMGs, team weapons, like AT guns, mortars. They cannot go through these boxes. If you go onto the uh, impasse editor, you can go through these one by one and basically look at which one you want. So let's say I, I want to look at HMGs. I want to know where my HMG teams and AT guns can go. So I'm going to select only infantry. I'm going to hit this arrow to go back on the overlay. And it tells me nicely, can my HMGs and AT guns get into this courtyard? Yes, they can. And they can here as well. Where can't they go? Well, they can't go between these tank traps. They also can't go between these tank traps. There's um, blockers on either side of that cell. But what they can also do is go through this gap if I made this cliff into a, um, a viz, they can. Just remember, whenever you make any changes, regenerate. So yeah, so they can technically go through this gap side of the building uh they can go up these ramps they could even go through these narrow gateways although at guns are slightly bigger than mgs and might not be able to do that mm -hmm. so this path map is a great tool for looking at your map in terms of gameplay i would look at this overlay at many many points in your map's development early on and right at the very end like before you post this to the workshop and prove that you've done Go through your map with this overlay on to see if there's any areas that you think are accessible but aren't. Uh, it's a very, very helpful way of just telling you any mistakes you made. Like here, for example, this cliff is still an entity and this entire area is inaccessible because of it. Oh, okay, yeah. Even though it's buried underground here, because the entire asset is still there somewhere, it's making all of this inaccessible. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I make this into viz and regenerate... It's gone. Right. So use this as your debugger. This is your way of checking if there's problems. But what this also tells us is things like here, where my river's going to be, is actually technically accessible. You can get down here. Right. So what I need to do is paint impasse to stop that from happening. Right, okay. This is also a very, very useful tool to look at vehicle pathfinding. So let's go back onto the impasse overlay. Let's turn on... Uh, trench crossing vehicle light and light vehicle and then hit this arrow to deselect all so now this tells us where light vehicles can go 
light vehicles like the Kranschutz and the Weasel, the 4x4, they, these are all notoriously difficult vehicles in our game because they can't crush much. They can't go through stone walls like tanks can. They get caught up on tank traps. So when you're looking at your map, you want to make sure these light vehicles have the easiest time that they can. So what this tells me is all these market stalls, sacks and crates and things like that, they can just blast right through those. Mm -hmm. They've got no trouble at all. What they can't do is go around these cars or go through these cars, I should say. And this gap where it's getting closer to the building and the cars, that's going to be too tricky for them to take. That's too narrow. So any light vehicles would have to go around. I could improve this situation by just moving these closer. So it doesn't even try. So any light vehicles that come in here, just go around. The same goes for gateways like this. They can technically get through that gap, but it might be too small for them, so make sure there are wider areas for them to go instead. Right. Would, would it be worthwhile uh, painting <clears throat> a light vehicle impasse in, the, in that sort of archway just to ensure that they're going through that wider gap that you've left for them and you know so to prevent them from getting hung up or trying it so that does actually lead to some problems uh, painted impasse is permanent so if i for example were to paint a spot here that says light vehicles cannot go through that gate ah, they'll go I around see. i see yeah if a tank then wipes out that wall there will still be this spot of light impasse that they will never be able to travel through I thought I was being clever, Will. But it is a, it's a legitimate um, question because yeah. it would make sense. But um, no, the, the impasse is permanent. What you have to rely on is that every asset in our maps has its own impasse. These walls have light vehicle impasse in them. And once they get destroyed, it's gone. Right, okay. So in the interest of time, I'm going to go through my map and finish off placing all the assets... I'm going to do the territory layout. I'm going to put some cover assets in there. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go and do all the rocks in impasse and blockers and make sure that's all good and done. I don't think there's anything left for us to cover until next time. Okay. Uh, I did have one quick question because um, I, I, I probably should have asked this in some of the previous episodes as well. But in, in the steps that we've kind of covered here, are there any kind of common mistakes that you see players making that, that you would maybe want to warn them against? So one of the most common problems that we, we see beginners uh, come across is actually what we've covered today. It is these, these rocks, the impasse that you can't see. If I were to, to hide this overlay, overlays are non. Oops, I missed it. Uh, oh, it's because I'm on the tool. There we go. So these areas look perfectly accessible. It looks like there's no reason why I couldn't mm -hmm. go on these. But it is the hidden impasse that assets create. Okay. Things like rocks casting a much bigger footprint. Um, even things like bridges. There's nothing stopping units walking across bridges from falling off them. Um, because there's no impasse. So what you'd need to do is grab all of your impasse and paint a border. If I just uh, expand it a little bit. Just paint a border like that that says units cannot step off this bridge. And I do that on all of them. So it's those hidden mechanics in our game that you never really see when you're playing it for yourself. You don't realize are a thing that we have to put into our maps. Um, so using your um, viz assets instead of normal entities, painting an impasse, using blockers, that sort of thing. Very, very important. Don't don't forget to do it. Besides that, easy mistakes to make <clears throat> are probably things like player ownership. So accidentally having some assets that are not set to world. So here we have our HQs that are set to player one, mm -hmm. player three, player two, player four. Accidentally having buildings or walls or rocks or territory points owned by a player means that your units will actively try to shoot them. I see. Okay. Um, and things like territory points are not meant to be destroyed. They don't have health values. Mm -hmm. So you'll find that your units are shooting at them and they'll never get rid of them. Right. That so, yeah, just make sure as you go through the world, just make sure everything is set to owner. You can, you can multiple select many things, just click and drag over it, or if they're all the same asset, I should say. 
Um, and it will still let you choose the ownership of multiple things that are selected. That's absolutely fine. But um, yeah, just a little a little tip. Okay. So it sounds like we have quite a bit of homework for next time. Uh, so thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, like, like Will said, we'll be back next time um, to cover the next steps. Thanks mm. so much, Will. Absolutely. No worries. Thanks for, thanks for joining us.